1961, Ken's introduced his Barbie's boyfriend. Luckiest guy in plastics. 1970. Ken bags Barbie. Ken bags Barbie. <laughs> Step one. Step two. 1970s. Ken is given a job as a fashion model and is shown to have interests, like I said, in sports, music, and art. Look at this guy. He has a little bit of personality coming in. We know what his he has interests the total are. Package. Yeah, yeah, he's a jock, but he also has an ear for music. And then he also paints in the corner to show his emotional side. A true Renaissance man. If Ken was a real human being, we both know he would not be into art. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Welcome to Travel Nerds, everybody. Today we're talking about something pretty cool, something very relevant in pop culture right now. Have you ever heard this song? I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. What do you think? Do you know it? First of all, amazing. Just coming in cold with the vocals on the episode. That was sick. Life in plastic. Oh, I could go. I could go in, but I won't. Maybe later. No. You can touch my hair. No, I'm just kidding. Take this <laughs> go for it, Connor. Come <laughs> just on. Just scream it in my house. Um, I share a wall with someone, so I won't do that. But basically, Barbie is taking the world by storm. Barbenheimer, which I love. Their marketing was just unbelievable. But it came out very recently. Have you seen it, Kenny? I have not, but there is a little trauma there. So I'm not sure that I'm going to see it. What? Trauma? Okay, we're definitely going to dig into that. But today's episode is going to be all about one of the most iconic franchises and pieces of IP in American history. We're digging into none other than Barbie herself. Kenny, what do you know about Barbie? I mean, I know, obviously, the dolls took the world by storm for about the last 60 years, but what do you know? So here's what I know. Barbie, first of all, is hot. And yeah. probably she's solely responsible for young Kenny falling in love with so many blondes during my early days. Uh, so that's probably my extent of Barbie here. Oh my gosh, really? Was this your, was this your perfect woman? <laughs> well, yeah, I feel like Barbie was the first symbol of beauty that I picked up on as a kid. And my earliest crush that I can remember was in kindergarten. It was a girl named Kelly. And she had the platinum blonde hair, the whole the, the whole thing. And kindergarten Kenny was head over heels. Did you and Kelly ever get to hang? Or like, did your mom set up a cute little play date for you guys? Sadly, no. Kelly is basically how I got the first taste of rejection at a really young age. <laughs> uh, but Kelly was definitely first of a laundry list of blondes that I had just huge crushes on. And it wasn't later in life until I kind of broadened my horizon to the brunettes and the redheads and everyone else. But I, I, it was, I blame Barbie for my infatuation at, at a young age. Honestly, same. Do you think Barbie made blondes more fun and attractive? A hundred percent. I think so too. Okay. Well, your kindergarten love life aside, the history of Barbie is fascinating. So here are some highlights. Barbie was created by Ruth Handler, co-founder of Mattel, the toy giant, in 1959. Handler was inspired by the Build Lily doll, a German adult figure doll that was popular in the 50s. But Handler wanted to create a doll that would allow girls to imagine themselves in adult roles rather than just being caregivers to baby dolls. So the first Barbie doll was introduced in 1959 at the American International Toy Fair in New York City. And the doll was an immediate success, selling over 300,000 units in its first year, which is insane in its first year. Can you take a guess on how much the original Barbie sold for? Ah, well, you're saying that this is the 50s, early 60s. So my, grand, my grandmother always brags about how she used to go to the movies for a quarter. So... <laughs> uh, I'm going to go that the first Barbie was $1 close actually it was three dollars ah okay well, well i assume that there's people like my aunt that buy it that buy these things and never open them what's an original barbie go for today like something that's unopened untouched the original i stumbled across this in my research and i actually thought the number was going to be higher take a guess mm, like five thousand bucks nope double that ten grand I honestly thought it was going to be 50,000 plus. So here's an interesting thing. 
Barbie was sold for about 20 to 30 years, an absolute superstar. But then in the 1980s, things started to sour. So in the 80s, Barbie began to face criticism for her unrealistic body image. How what did Barbie body- do? I know. How can we body shame Barbie? This is so sad. Come on. <laughs> so, however, um, Mattel responded by introducing a variety of body types and skin tones for Barbie dolls. And Barbie's also been criticized for her lack of diversity. But Mattel's made efforts to address this by introducing dolls from different countries and backgrounds. So today, Barbie is still one of the most popular toys in the whole world. She's been featured in movies, obviously, television shows, video games. She's also just a cultural icon and her image has been used to sell everything from clothes to cars to lunch boxes and of course the fabulous margot robbie i'm in love with her is playing barbie in the film has there ever been a better casting than this honestly no i mean margot's probably the perfect casting do you think that margot was first on the list are there any other blondes that you think were in the running to play barbie I actually read a handful of articles that said it was between it was between Margot Robbie and Amy Schumer. Oh, thank God it's not Amy Schumer. That's what that the whole not... internet said. <laughs> really? I mean, Amy Schumer, she's great, but she's not Barbie. The comments were savage. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no one better than Margot to play this role. I can't wait to see it. I have not seen it because I don't want to go alone because there's just groups of girls wearing like pink cocktail dresses arriving in squads. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to get maybe Diva to go with me. Yeah. I can rent her out for the night for sure. Perfect. Uh, In my research, I came across two other crazy stats. You ready? Hit me. Mattel has sold over 1 billion Barbie dolls worldwide. Billion with a B. There's one bar. Wait a second. One billion Barbie dolls. That means there's 7 billion people on earth. That means that in theory, I know it's over a long period of time, but in theory, there's like for one in seven people could possibly own a Barbie doll. How insane is that? It's insane. And Barbie's been featured in over a hundred movies and television shows. I mean, that's just the best. Not only is the Barbie marketing from, from the fifties, sixties, like it was incredible then it's unbelievable now. This new movie, their marketing budget was a hundred million dollars. Oh Wrap your head God. around okay. that. Just the marketing. All right. All right. So you're telling me that Barbie as a franchise is potentially worth tens of billions of dollars. You have to work backwards. If a business makes one billion dollars per year, usually their value in like the public markets will be uh, some kind of multiple on their revenue. So maybe if you made $1 billion, your business would be worth between seven and $15 billion. You're telling me that Barbie is possibly worth tens of billions of dollars as an enterprise. Exactly. How insane is that? Oh my God. Okay. So enough about Barbie. Let's get to the good, to the good stuff. Let's talk about Ken. Now I know. Yeah. Right. So, uh, (laughs) This was like the bane of my existence from like uh, preschool to third grade and third grade. There was a switch and I became who killed Kenny. Thank you, South Park. Uh, (laughs) But I know nothing about Ken other than Ken is Barbie's girlfriend and little kids used to tease me about (laughs) Ken is Barbie's boyfriend. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) He's still identifies as a male and uh, little kids used to tease me about being Ken. Which honestly, look, looking back, kids are so dumb, right? Barbie is a smoke show, perfectly proportioned. Ken's everywhere should be celebrating for pulling a Barbie. But honestly, as a kid, I, I felt like it was teasing because I guess they said it in a teasing manner. And I wasn't smart enough to be like, listen, if I end up like a Barbie and you end up with Janice from accounting, I'm going to be. I'm going to be the winner here. Okay. So, uh, but you know, little Kenny, I did, I took it, you know, I didn't take it well. And then people would tease me on oh, Barbie and Ken. I was like, wait a second. But looking back, I was like, Barbie's a smoke show. <laughs> Janice is everywhere. Unsubscribing from the pod. No, I, that is, Ken is like the, you know, he's supposed to be the pinnacle of, of male hotness. So I, they didn't know what they were talking about. A high schooler, a college kid would definitely not have made fun of you for being Ken. Kindergarten, you know, it's just because he was a doll. That's all. 
<laughs> okay, so here's the backstory about Ken. He started off mm. as this badass dude, and then over time they made him into a simp. So Ken, no. Barbie's <laughs> Yeah, did they not? I mean, come on. Ken, Barbie's boyfriend, was created in 1961 by Mattel in response to complaints from consumers that Barbie was too single, which is true. A girl like that, she needs a boyfriend. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Ken was named after Ruth Handler's son, Kenneth, and Ken's backstory has evolved mm. over the years. So initially, he was simply Barbie's boyfriend. However, in the 1970s, Mattel began to give Ken more of a personality and a backstory, gave him a little reality to, you know, his plastic ass. So he was given a job as a fashion model, and he was also shown to have interests in sports, music, and art. What a crafty guy, huh? So in the 1990s, <laughs> Ken's backstory became more complex, as most things did in the 90s. He was shown <laughs> he was shown to be struggling with his identity and his place in the world. So he was also shown to be dealing with those issues, such as body image and self-esteem, which I love that they took that, <laughs> they took the things that girls typically worry about and gave those troubles to Ken. So in I gave it to a dude. Gave it to Ken. He's real insecure and has low self-esteem. <laughs> His body image issues, body dysmorphia, if you will. So in recent years, Ken's backstory has become more progressive. He's shown to be more supportive of Barbie's career. He's also been shown to be more involved in childcare. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> so funny. He's also been shown to be more diverse with dolls representing different ethnicities and body types, just like they did with Barbie. And Ken, still being Barbie's boyfriend, he's also just, he's so much more than that, Kenny. They tried to develop him into a complex character. A dude with emotions? Come on. Can't some things just be aspirational? <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. You want to hear some of the key moments in Ken's backstory? Yeah, I feel like this guy has had a crazy arc. I also just pulled up a picture of Ken. If this guy has body dysmorphia, I don't know what the rest of us are going to end up with. He's like, uh, he's jacked, he's chiseled, he has good flowing hair. I mean, if this guy has body dysmorphia, the rest of us are kind of SOL, no? I mean, you know. I mean, he... if you saw Ken walking down the street, are you walking up to him? 100%. Smack that ass. Oh no, I'm God. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen to these key points of Ken's uh, existence. So, Go 1961, Ken's introduced as Barbie's boyfriend. Luckiest guy in plastics. 1970. Ken bags Barbie. Ken bags Barbie. <laughs> Step one. Step two. 1970s. Ken is given a job as a fashion model and is shown to have interests like I said, in sports, music, and art. Look at this guy. He has a little bit of personality coming in. We know what his interests are. He has the total are. package. Yeah, yeah, he's a jock, but he also has an ear for music. And then he also paints in the corner to show his emotional side. A true Renaissance man. If Ken was a real human being, we both know he would not be into art. That's all I got to say. <laughs> 1990s. Ken's backstory becomes more complex, struggles with his identity, doesn't know who he is. And this is kind of like a funny, weird thing they're putting him up in juxtaposition to barbie as like barbie's this confident badass with an awesome career excelling and then they just i wonder what the choice was to paint him as this like insecure guy who doesn't know who he is that's kind of that's kind of interesting as a marketing tactic let's make ken like super not confident <laughs> and always feeling like he's gonna barbie's gonna slip through his fingers you know 2000 yeah. Ken becomes more supportive of Barbie's career and specifically they mention and show in all types of advertising that he is now a caregiver. He wants to be heavily involved in childcare. I love this. He's a stay at home dad. Exactly. <laughs> his Barbie so is the breadwinner. His modeling career. Yeah. His modeling career kind of fans out. He's getting a little older. The crow's feet have set in. He's lost some of that muscle tone. And yeah. now Barbie just sits him down and goes, listen, I'm still hot. I'm still plastic. You got to get in that kitchen, boy. You exactly. got to start taking care of these kids, doing the diapers. No more modeling for you. I got this. And then basically 
Ken becomes a beta simp, which is not great for him. The thought of him just doing laundry and dishes. And yeah, I love that he became that guy. So in the 2010s, Ken becomes more diverse, dolls representing different body types and ethnicities, like I said. So he made a a trajectory here that never really resulted in like pinnacle killing it Ken behavior. He always was riding on Barbie's coattails and they just over time made him more and more sad. No. (laughs) Yeah, definitely more, more sad. I I hate to sound old school here, but why couldn't they just have left Ken as Barbie's hot boyfriend? Would that have been so bad? It was never about Ken in the first place. Them trying to give him this whole complex identity crisis. Why? That's not great for marketing. Girls don't want to just go to the store and buy a Barbie doll that has, you know, intense insecurity issues. <laughs> you don't you don't want that. I mean, we all bought him for the apps. It wasn't for his midlife crisis, but yeah, I just I agree. They should have just said, "This is Ken. He's gorgeous." Bam. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you this, Con. So it seems like in the 1990s with Ken, there was this inflection point. And as you know, sometimes how these things happen in business, there's some creative team. There are some Monday morning meeting and they're talking about the story arc of Ken. All right. Let's transport you. I know that it would be six years until you were born, right? So, but let's take you back to the year 1990 and you are in that Monday morning meeting and you basically get to pitch, what should we do with Ken? What are you going to do with the character? Well, they should have done what they did with Barbie, to be honest. Like, they should have taken NASCAR Ken, scuba diver Ken, astronaut Ken. I feel like that would have been more profitable than just popping out this guy with an apron on into the into the stores saying this is the type of guy you want to be with Uh uh-uh i don't need your insecurity issues washing over me no sir barbie can get whoever she wants i don't know i don't know what the uh i don't know what the plan there was with them like giving him so much exposure they built this whole backstory of where he came from and who he is and then they never really gave him a chance to shine is how i feel what do you think I would have rather much seen Ken and Barbie just been a traditional power couple. I want them to almost be like John Krasinski and Emily Blunt, right? They both have their own careers. They both stand on their own two feet. They're both badasses in their own right. And then they come together at the end of the day and they, you know, make plastic harmony. That's what I would have rather have seen rather than making simp beta Ken. That's not great. Now, Did I get the simp beta thing when I was being made fun of in kindergarten? I don't think that he was such a (laughs) simp beta guy yet, nor does a kin, nor does a kindergartner really understand what a simp is. Right. So, um, I didn't get that, but I don't know. This dude's iconic. He has like the blonde hair, the washboard abs. I do have this creepy photo of Ken in all denim that I don't love that we're going to have to (laughs) just kindly ask Google to get rid of because it's really creeping me out. But yeah, Ken and Barbie should have been a Hollywood power couple. That's how it should have ended. I agree. I agree. It was a missed opportunity too, because, you know, there weren't just girls playing with Barbie dolls. Guys were playing with Barbie dolls too. Why couldn't they have made Ken just Barbie's awesome counterpart? And they could have pitched them as, you know, Bonnie and Clyde Ken. You know what I'm saying? King and queen Ken and Barbie. I just, they, they missed out. It was, it was, they blew it. <laughs> and he's still to this day, based on the movie, which I have not seen, but I have heard. Ken is, Ken is a simp. In the movie, really? And then they got Ryan Gosling to play Ken in the movie, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What do you think of that casting? Because you were pro Margot Robbie. Are you pro Ryan Gosling? I guess I'll have to see it. To really have an opinion on it, but um, mm. I don't know. I'm I'm not like the biggest Ryan Gosling fan, to be honest with you. Is Ryan Gosling in the Notebook? Yes, uh, most he did good most at, notoriously, of course. He did good in that one, and he got to he got to be with Rachel McAdams on set for quite a while. That's he's a lucky guy. Oh my god, Are you kidding me? 
I would have happily played that role in the notebook of Ryan Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it more diverse. Just let me be her love interest. It would have never worked. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that we're going to have to see Barbie. I'm going to probably get dragged to it. I'm not wearing pink. I'm wearing all black. I'm going to put back on these sunglasses when I roll up in there. Because for my image, I just can't be seen rolling into a Barbie movie. But as a Ken, I feel like it's my duty to see the movie so we can follow up next pod with a review. And you have to wear pink. That's what the people are doing. Also, those glasses do not put you incognito enough. I would invest in maybe a fake mustache or a gigantic hat. Yeah, I could do a gigantic hat. I can also just grow a real mustache, but then people start looking at me because I look like a creep in a mustache. <laughs> like I got creep. Okay, I would love to switch topics into something super relevant right now. Did you see this bill in the Senate, the one that would have killed travel loyalty points? It was shoved in yeah. the defense bill or snuck in, if you will. Yeah, basically, this was really dirty. And if this goes through, these people that sponsored this bill, they will not get reelected because Democrat or Republican, what people love the most in the world is their points. And most Americans have a travel rewards credit card, which is how they decrease the spend uh, or decrease the amount of money that they're forced to spend on vacation. So when I saw this, I was immediately enraged. Um, I don't care what party that I vote for. If the party that I run with tried to push this through, I'm going with the other party because I'm points above party. That's me. Yeah. Now, the retail lobby is heavily backing this law, but consumer advocates are saying it would be a disaster for consumers, and it would. So here's the thing. Visa and MasterCard charge a fee to retailers every time a customer uses their credit card to make a purchase. We know this, right? And that fee is how the companies make money. But if this law passes, it would allow retailers to choose cheaper, less safe credit card processing networks. That would mean consumers would get absolutely screwed. So the cheaper networks are less secure. There's a higher risk of fraud, identity theft. And on top of that, the cheaper networks don't offer any rewards. So customers will lose out on all the free stuff they get from using their credit cards, which for me personally is the reason I got my platinum card is just totally. for the rewards and benefits. So uh, this whole thing is just really sad. I, I think like, Bottom line, if this law passes, it would be a huge win for retailers, huge loss for consumers. And if you care about your credit card rewards at all, you need to make sure this law doesn't pass. Let's have a travel nerds lobbying moment where we all meet up at Congress and freak <laughs> out as a squad. <laughs> okay. Me, if you are out there listening, Connor Ann and I will be on the steps of Congress August 8th, and we'll be marching <laughs> to make sure that we stand up for you. And you get to keep your points so you can take your next badass vacation to wherever that you want to go. The two U.S. senators that are backing this, one is a Democrat and the other is a Republican, which is which is how you know that it's dirty when they combine when they forces. Team up. <laughs> yeah. When they team up, then you're like, so it's Richard Durbin, who is a Democrat, and Roger Marshall. Richard Ooh. and Roger. Mm. Boo to them for sure. So we definitely want this to pass. I personally hate when they try to stuff things into bills where they don't belong. This is just, this would be bad. And I think that this would be bad for the airlines because we are going to plan an episode in the coming weeks about how the airlines essentially have become banks and the airlines rely on points and credit cards to basically make revenue. And it's way way bigger and way, way more than you think. And we're going to have an episode coming up on that. So I think yes. that this would be disastrous for the travel industry as well. I mean, come on, man. Who wants to give up their free flights and hotel stays? Not me. Uh, honestly, not me. not me. I would vote for any party that basically allowed me to keep my points. I'm a points voter, single issue, vo single issue voter. I'm a points guy. Now I Googled it because I wanted to be able to share this. So this, these are the ways that we can stop this credit card competition act of 2023, which is what it's called. So it says, learn more about the proposed legislation. 
The more you know, the more equipped you'll be to advocate against it. Of course. We did our research. We know stuff. Contact your lawmakers. This I didn't even know you could do. (laughs) So tell your lawmakers that you oppose the Credit Card Competition Act and that you urge them to vote against it. And then they give you a link to the House of Representatives and the Senate. (laughs) You can literally contact them and just send an email and be like, no, spread the word. Let your friends and family and social media people know this is happening because the problem is things like this don't get a lot of exposure, do they? The fact that this even came out and people know about it before it got passed is great. So we need to like hone in on this and then support organizations that are fighting against the law. So there's a number of organizations fighting against the act and you can support them by donating money or volunteering your time or just like spreading the articles and spreading the information about their work that they're doing. So how much is there that we can actually control about this? Not a lot, which is scary. We got to make sure that this does not pass because if it does, we're all screwed. Everybody who got that Amex Platinum card for the points, you are now just paying $700 annual fee for what? (laughs) Club club access. That's about it. Oh, so sad. So dirty too. I mean, I'm not one to ever talk about politics, mostly just because I'm uninformed, but, uh, the fact that they can sneak in dirty little things into bills and have it pass through, it was never talked about in the media. We don't even know that this is getting passed. The amount of things that must have slipped through the cracks over the years is terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah, there's so much blow and wasted money in the federal budget. It's disgusting. But let's wrap up the show. I do want to talk a little bit and give a thank you to the gentleman that watched our YouTube prank video on John Cena and wrote a very nice article about us. That was fantastic. I was in Sky Club. Uh, I took my mom to New York last weekend on a little mother-son trip, Mm -hmm. and I got a Google alert for Connor Ann's name. And then I clicked into it, and I saw that our prank got picked up, and the gentleman wrote a really nice article, and I sent it to Connor, and Connor had a little freak out. It was su- super cute, and then she sent it to her entire family, and her family was gassing her up, and uh, Connor, do you want to talk more about the article? It's so cute. Basically, it just covers exactly what happened in the video, and it covers it accurately. Instead of just saying, you yeah. know, the the summarized version of what happened, it was very thorough, and it gave a lot of information about me. Not all correct, but I appreciate even the incorrect bits because it made me seem cooler than I am. It said An I was Australian access. Yeah. It says, I was an Australian actress. actress. (laughs) I have access to being an Australian actress. And it said I was 28. So I'm like aging really slowly, basically. So the article is on essentiallysports.com and it's written by Kaif Ali. This is the headline. I got punk so hard. Despite having no bad intentions, John Cena left a young actress, me, I'm young, heartbroken as she fell victim to a multi-day prank. I just... That is so good. That is so good. It says, um, a celebrity stardom can make a fan behave in extreme ways. First of all, I just love that this whole thing is like, it's pitching me as if I have John Cena posters all over my room, all over my walls. And I just, is it not true? I mean, it is now they're there now, (laughs) but before the prank, uh, you know, I was obviously a John Cena fan who isn't, but I just love that it's turning into, into this. It's fantastic. And let me, let me pull another line from this. So as an actress, the Australian talent saw a great opportunity because Cena could be inviting her to discuss a new project. Thank you for clarifying that article because that was something that I was like, oh my God, they're going to paint it in a weird light. And even though the Australian star heart broke, <laughs> nor my heart is broken, she discovered it to be a prank and there could, poss- <laughs> there could be a possibility of the peacemaker approaching her for a project after all. Please send this shit to John Cena. The article is <laughs> outlining that... After all, he might still (laughs) want to work with me. I just think this is the fact that somebody wrote an entire article just based off of our video, which just shows the power of media, right? 
You don't totally. have to do anything crazy. If it's something a, a little bit outside of the box, a little bit interesting, it can get picked up. This We did not send this to Essentially Sports. They just did it. And I just want to say thank you to him and thank you for writing that. And, you know, till the next prank. Yeah, till the next prank. But I will say, if I do a stage two or I have a next prank, <clears throat> and cure us out. Um, if I have a next prank, <laughs> oh, now you're worried, right? Oh my God. Um, so if there is a next prank and you are going to write a follow-up article, just know that a lot of the hard work that makes the prank happen is falls on my shoulders and I deserve to at least be mentioned as the mastermind of the prank. I did not care for that part, but I like the part that they gas you up and they make you sound super fancy. So just in the future, Give a little credit where credit is due. This <laughs> multi-day prank just didn't happen out of thin air. I built that world, and I deserve I, a shot. <laughs> I'm the world builder here, and this is baloney. No, I completely agree. I mean, all I did in this prank was fall victim. I had no planning. I had no... Kenny did a lot of crazy shit to make this happen, so the article should actually be called Boss Punk's Employee So Hard that it was multi-day and cost a lot of money. <laughs> Not yeah, as good of a headline. I would say, but. Yeah, I would say prank mastermind, Sir <laughs> Kenny Totten, pranks young, up-and-coming star actress, Connor Ann Wat Waterman, in conjunction with John Cena himself. Watch the video. Con Cena, who is she? <laughs> 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 who is Con Cena? Everyone's talking about Con Cena. Who is this mysterious Australian act actress? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm gonna start talking like. No, that was British. I can't. I can't right now. But usually, my Australian accent's kind of on point. Maybe we'll do oh, an episode one good. day, all the way through in Australian. I can't hang with you. I'm going to have to do an Indian accent. So if you're like an Australian chick, I'll do the Indian guy and then we'll officially be canceled. I was just going to say, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, I, it's a, it's a bummer that you can't just do fun accents these days and you'll immediately get, you know, get the, the red X over your name. It's a bummer. You can't do anything cross-cultural if you're a white male, a white male, you can only, impersonate like other celebrities, but you can't do like a stereotypical accent. You could do like a Jersey accent, a New York accent, something that's not connected to like a culture um, yeah. or like an ethnicity. But um, yeah, so maybe I'll have to rethink the Indian thing and I'll just go with like a Jersey or a Staten Island accent. Hit me with a Jersey accent. I can't, I need to, I need to talk with my coach first. You have stage fright right now? <laughs> Big stage fright. What's weird this. is that I grew up in Jer in Jersey, but I don't have a Jersey accent and I never picked one up. And the only accent that I ever picked up, uh, was like the Jewish mom accent because I grew up with a lot of Jewish people that were from Staten Island. And so I always, I just picked it up. I got the Jewish mom, like Maritza, Maritza, you better come for dinner. Marissa, your dad's been waiting here for 10 minutes. That's really good. That's really good. Uh, that's you have all I got. a future being a Jewish mother. Marissa, you better be down here in 10 fucking minutes. Oh, I swear to God. I love that. <laughs> when I listen to that back, that's going to sound crazy. I mean, let's sign us out of the show here. Do you want to just sing a little tune for Barbie and just sign us out and we'll just end it? Should we? How's it start? Um, it's, I'm I forgot a Barbie the girl, right? No, the the how's it start? She's like, oh yeah, it does start like that because it's like, uh, I want to go for a ride. Okay, Barbie, hop in. Okay, Ken. That's how it starts. That's right. Are you gonna play me some background music, or am I just acapelling? I think you just acapella it. Okay, you ready? Go for I'm it. I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Life in plastic. It's fantastic. You can brush my hair. Undress me everywhere. Imagination. Life is your creation. Come on, Barbie. Let's go on it. Mm, 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 yeah. Oh my God. So good. And then that, those lyrics as I'm listening, like undress me everywhere. 
<laughs> Barbie, a little oh. scandalous girl. Come on. What does he say? Uh, then the next line is, um, I can walk, I can talk, do whatever you please. I can act like a star. I can beg on my knees. Dirty. So jump in on my friend and let's do it again. Ten and time, girl and time, let's go party. That's actually not oh that far God. off from how he sounds in that song. It's insane. Yeah, you know what? That but song was definitely written by so a man. so dirty. Like it's a, bar- it's a Barbie song, a kid's doll, and it's like, you can touch, you can play. That's... <laughs> Oh. That was written by a man. If that if that was written in the '60s, that's written by a dude. And didn't they try to cancel one of these Christmas songs, "Baby, It's Cold Outside"? They did. How is the Barbie song just paraded around, and "Baby, It's Cold Outside" is not? Am dude. I missing something here? Well, they said that the "Baby, It's Cold Outside" was a little rapey, which I love that song. Is it? I guess it can be. I'm just saying pound for pound. I'm looking at the lyrics here. I think the Barbie song is worse than Baby It's Cold Outside. Am I wrong? No, it's way worse. And also really off brand from who Ken is, who we just said he was, this insecure guy. And then the guy in the song is like in charge of Barbie. He's like, I'm going to make you whatever I want you to be, Barbie. It's yeah, it's really, it doesn't yeah. add up, but baby is cold outside. It's this, this is the part where everyone's like, don't love it. Um, neighbor is my thing. Baby is bad out there. Say what's in this drink. No cabs to be had out there. <laughs> it's like, he's like, you're staying. Uh, yeah, she, well, basically she just keeps saying no. And he just keeps saying yes. So I guess it's a consent thing with this song. <laughs> Oh my God. But it's like a playful. No, it's the flirty. No, like, no, we shouldn't do that. No, I should go home. But like, yeah, as she they're saying, it. no, they're like walking a little closer. You know, it's like, no, we shouldn't. For those of you who listen all the way through to the end of the episode, we are filming an episode on Saturday where we're going to talk about the first person that I think ever got canceled in popular culture, Christopher <laughs> Columbus. So I need you guys to run over to YouTube, hit the subscribe and the bell, because you're not going to want to miss the Christopher Columbus episode. It's going to be fantastic. And uh, yeah, I would say that that's probably the episode. He's a real dog, that Chris Columbus. Yeah, oh, yeah. we're going to cover it. It's going to be actually hilarious. And um we're, we're doing like a rendition of drunk history. So if you want to see how Kenny and I are after, you know, two, three margaritas, this will be the perfect episode to gauge how fun we are. <laughs> but anyways, thank you guys so much for listening. If you have anything you want us to talk about, email us at hello at travelnerds.co. I hope you liked our last episode with Giulio Gallarati. It was fantastic. He got kidnapped by the Taliban. Go listen to it. Later, nerds.